really excited here to introduce my colleague from RBC, Corey Jackson. Corey, you are the senior curator of the RBC Art Collection. Tell us a little bit about who you are, how you got into that role and your path to RBC. Like a lot of roles in the arts speckled with a lot of different jobs that have kind of led me to where I am now. Uh, my schooling was always anchored in art. I did my undergrad in studio art and art history and English and then ended up doing a master's in curatorial studies, which is kind of more of a theory and philosophy around contemporary art. That was my focus. The role that I have now at RBC is really, in a lot of ways, a conflation of so many of those different experiences. Um, working with historical art, working with contemporary artists who are living and making. My role is managing the art collection, which is over 5,500 pieces globally but it's also building that collection and thinking about the role of art today and how can we put art on the walls of RBC spaces to spark conversation and dialogue. And that's kind of the anchor and the core of a lot of what I do every day. Corey, you've been work, your, work, your work with the bank allows us to have art impact community in a whole bunch of different ways and a really interesting vantage point. But RBC's role in art is not new. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. This is not a new endeavor. I mean, art's been a part of our social community fabric for eons. So it's uh, it's no surprise that RBC's been in, engaged in the space for a long time. The collection itself started in 1929. That was really just anchored in artworks that were going into spaces. People realize they need to live with something or work with something that's gonna kind of reflect who they are on the walls, reflect the bank in a positive light, reflect the communities we serve. So that was how it started and was sparked. Um, but there's been a lot of, I think, pretty significant milestones since then as well. Um, outside of the collections, there's also the amazing work that my peers at the RBC Foundation do. Actually, when I started at RBC, the curatorial group was part of the RBC Foundation, which really, I think, reflects the relationship between working with artists in the collection perspective and then also the philanthropic work that the Foundation does. In 2007, they started the RBC Emerging Artist Project, and that's been really anchored in um, supporting emerging artists in the early stages of their careers. And of course, that has also had a really wonderful influence on the way that we think about the collection as that becomes a real part of our corporate culture and what we're doing for our communities. We'd like to reflect that in the work that we apply. One of the things we're seeing in talking to our audiences at Ensemble is there's a renewed excitement around art with younger Canadians the growth of new luxury choices, new ways consumers are deciding to buy, new formats of art, everything from art on paper to NFTs. And when you think about charting the new course for, you know, say RBC's role in support, promotion, community outreach with art, how do you balance all that? where we're seeing this kind of influx of things like digital sales, you spoke about NFTs. It's, it just goes back to art being a reflection in a lot of ways of the times and the mediums and the ways of thinking that are current and within the moment of production. So, you know, digital art is, is nothing new. Artists have been working in digital media for, for decades now, video or before that. Um, and I think, you know, looking at NFTs is an extension of how we're understanding our relationship to digital contracts, uh, how we understand, um, you know, communication of value in an interesting way. But I think for a lot of young people, there's also this real opportunity to understand how value gets built within uh, the art sector over time and what that's also looked like historically. So when you look at an auction house, for example, and you are looking at the value of an artwork that they're estimating a piece to go for, they'll also list the provenance behind the artwork. And that's something that you know, digital contracts and NFTs have taken into account. They're tracing kind of this history of, of, of an artwork's uh, production and, and how it's going to be displayed and kind of owned in the world. But the provenance of an artwork in that maybe more traditional sense is also, well, what museums has it exhibited at? Uh, who's written about it? What texts are uh, that artist celebrated in? 
And that really points to the role of the artist as a cultural producer and someone who's influencing and affecting how we engage with the world. And in a lot of ways, that's where the real value in art sits. So I think that there's, you know, as you said, a lot of interest, but you know, with that, a real responsibility for anyone who's getting into art to think about, well, not just do I love this piece, but why? And if I love it, is it something that is also a part of this social fabric? Is it a part of our community? Is it a piece by an artist who's engaged in that meaningful way? Where do you see this growing as well? As, uh, as you think about, we think about the audience, we think about the artist, um, mm. and where we're going to find those artists in the future. We're no. tearing down the walls that more people can see art. And I'm, I hope, I think that means it's a growing industry overall, whether you're a buyer or a seller or a, um, an administrator. Well, or even an, just a patron trying to get access to art. Sure. I think that this moment has really shifted what access means. It's democratized it in different ways. And also brought, I think, a little more depth of understanding into the work behind the production of, of uh, an artwork. It's really become much more about that storytelling piece. I think one of the things that we've seen is there is increased sales and things online, uh, especially in the past year, that's coming with this increased transparency. And historically, to enter into the art market has been, I think for a lot of people, regardless of age, a real barrier. And walking into a commercial art gallery or even a museum, there's not really an understanding of what something might cost outside of maybe auction houses, which have done very well in the past years, but they also have really increased visibility and transparency of, of their processes. I think going online, there's been this real transparency in the cost and value of contemporary art. And it's made it much easier to kind of sit and be like, oh, well, I'm interested in this artist. I'm drawn to it. I feel like it's reflecting maybe some of the social trends that I'm seeing, it's reflecting some of the questions I'm asking myself. I'm seeing a new point of view through this work, which is, I think, responding to a lot of the social shifts that we've all navigated in the past few years and the role of art as a tool to work through that. But then there's also this enhanced opportunity to just understand where a price sits at. For young people thinking about uh, um, enjoying, curating, or potentially trying to work in this space, what, where to start? So if you're interested in artist work, maybe you see something at the AGO or a museum that you walk into and it's, it's, it's a young artist that's being exhibited and you're like, well, I'm really curious, how do I learn more? You can look them up, see if they have a commercial gallery. A lot of artists have websites, social media accounts as well. But the CV is a great place to look because you can actually just, similar to many CVs for the rest of us, go down and look at what are those career moments. And for an artist, those moments will affect and have a positive impact in their, um, their value. So what their works will go for. Because as those opportunities arise, the artist kind of social capital increases, their impact and visibility within a community increases. So for a lot of young artists, that might be their first group show, that they've had a show in a publicly funded institution. That means someone whose profession is curatorial uh, or a jury has gone through and vetted their work and deemed them this is something that needs to be part of a public and social conversation. I know for myself, when I'm starting to look at really young emerging artists, the thing that I'm drawn to isn't you know just standing in front of a work and being like, oh, I love this, because I'm not collecting for myself. I'm collecting for a collection whose audience is really vast. It's actually hearing from the community around that artist, other artists who are championing that work and saying, this is, artist is doing something I haven't seen before. And, and you know, just because you love something might not mean that it's the right place to put your money. I mean, and I, I really would encourage everyone who is looking and thinking about living with art to acquire pieces they want to live with, but not necessarily because they're beautiful or fit with an aesthetic, but because it's going to challenge you and, and you're going to walk by it every day and it's going to make you think or have a conversation that you know is important to you in a different way. I think the idea of intentional buying, if that's a term today, you know, um, to artists that champion social causes that you were saying, or artists with voices from certain communities, 
Are you seeing that as a longer term thread as young people interact with art and artists and grow into the next buyers? Or do, is that something really more for headlines? I don't think that's for headlines. I think it's it's coming with an awareness that art is and, and has been for a long time, a, a mirror to our society. And as we're becoming, I think, more aware of the need for an understanding and empathy for experiences outside of our own, no matter what our background, there's a realization of art as a really amazing tool for us to be able to jump into those conversations or bring those different perspectives into our spaces. And that's something that I think museums and art institutions are also taking on and working through. Institutions that collect are reflecting back on, well, what have we collected and what have we missed along the way? And what does it mean to collect moving forward? Um, and how do we make sure that there is more diverse and inclusive artists reflected in our collections? Could you recommend, or who's a new artist you love? What are What's a new channel if somebody wanted to, or a resource if somebody wanted to learn more hmm. about art? Look at art magazines, literature, people who are writing about art. Writing about art is a really important part of the ecosystem. It's a part of how the artist's ideas and intents can kind of be broken down a little bit and maybe made more accessible for someone who isn't as familiar with maybe that medium or way of working. Um, I also would really encourage anyone who's situated within Canada to take a look at artists from centers in their community. These are spaces that are usually the first spaces emerging artists exhibit. They're run by other artists. And so when I talked about that idea of artists championed by their community, those are the spaces where it happens. If you want to learn more about what RBC is doing, you can go to rbc.com slash visual arts. There's a lot of content there. Part of it is the collection. Uh, there's a few highlights, certainly not all 5,500 works, but a few hundred pieces where you can scroll through and kind of see what draws you in. And those are all artists that we're really, really proud to be able to collect and feel like their work is part of a important way of looking. Uh, and there's also some really wonderful videos that we've been doing in their From Within series, where we take you into the artist studio and let you dive deep and listen to why an artist's making and how they're making and what their motivations are. And not just looking at the work as, as it is, but also the story behind it is really important. And there's a lot more resources right now that are available. Lori, I want to thank you very much. The perspective and uh, that you bring to us is fascinating with the opportunity for art to do more work in the community and communities across uh, our country. But at the same time, we really appreciate you helping us think about where art's going and uh, getting more involved in it. So thanks for joining us today at Ensemble. We really appreciate your time. Well, thanks. So nice to be a part of the conversation and also to take this moment to celebrate the fact that art is becoming this more accessible, visible part of, of our culture. And uh, I hope your audience will go and go to a gallery after this. Go see something in person if you can.